Welcome everyone and good evening. I uh, see a lot of folks joining our webinar tonight and it's so great to have so many of you joining us from the, across the country um, for our webinar on prostate cancer treatment options and risk mitigation for radiation ther therapy. Our webinar tonight is brought to you by Zero, the end of prostate cancer and our amazing partners at Boston Scientific. My name is Shelby Monier, Vice President of Patient Programs and Education here at Zero, and I will be serving as your webinar host this evening. I want to thank our featured speaker, Dr. Albert Chang, for his time and expertise, um, and I will get to doc Dr. Chang's introduction in just one moment. Uh, before we begin, I would like to go over just a couple of housekeeping items, and I promise I will try to make these quick. Um, first, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, zerocancer.org, tomorrow in the webinar section of our website. And as soon as our webinar ends this evening, um, you will see a link to a survey, uh, a couple of shameless plugs for our survey. We would really love for you to participate in that survey. We value your feedback more than you know. Um, we rely on your feedback on not only this event, but, but to help us choose topics to present uh, for future webinars and educational opportunities. And then tomorrow you'll receive an email with a link to the recording and also um, a friendly reminder to take that survey to let us know what you thought of tonight's webinar. So um, one additional survey opportunity I wanted to make our listeners aware of is a, um, a patient access and education survey in partnership with Duke University researchers and Pfizer Oncology. Um, this, this is a, a survey that's hoping to help us better understand the needs of prostate cancer patients. These results will help build programs, develop initiatives, um, improve patient access to produce ultimately just better outcomes for all people impacted by prostate cancer. We are thrilled that we already have more than 800 patients from around the country who have participated in the survey. The survey takes about 17 minutes. It is um, an investment, but I, um, like I said, we can't tell you how much we value your experience and your insight. Um, our colleagues have just posted that link in uh, the um, chat feature of this webinar, so please if you haven't taken that already, we would love to have your participation in that survey. For those of you not already familiar with Zero, Zero is the leading national nonprofit with the mission to end prostate cancer and help all who are impacted. Zero advances research, provides support, and creates solutions to achieve health equity to meet the most critical needs of our community. Next, I wanted to share uh, really just the extensive portfolio of our patient support programs and educational tools, which are, of course, offered to the community at no cost. Um, so if you or someone you know is in need of resources at any time during a prostate cancer diagnosis, um, please share these resources. Let those people know that they are not alone and that we are here to help. Uh, so just really quickly, I wanted to run through a couple of our programs and educational opportunities. So first is 0360. 0360 is our comprehensive patient support program. Patients can be paired with a case manager, a trained case manager, to help them connect with financial assistance programs, navigate insurance, um, find other kinds of support like emotional support, transportation assistance. Um, even getting connected to a local food pantry if you need some assistance getting food on the table for a little while. Um, we also offer a program called Zero Mentor and Zero Caregiver Connector. And these are our peer-to-peer -peer support programs where we really, uh, we, we play kind of match.com or eHarmony.com and we match patients with other patients, caregiver with, with their peers uh, who have had similar experiences so that you can get and receive that ongoing one-on-one -on -one support. We also have Zero Connect, which is an online patient Facebook, uh, private Facebook support group, excuse me, and Inspire, which is an online patient forum. And these are online groups, as, as we've said, and they allow you to connect online at your convenience um, and, and get connected with other people who are affected by prostate cancer. So you can learn from their experiences and, and get questions to some, uh, get, get some answers to some questions that you might have. 
last fall, Zero and us two merged to become one organization, which has just been incredibly exciting. And with that merger, the us two support groups became uh, the newest addition to Zero support programs. And we're thrilled to have support groups all over the United States. We actually even have some out some outside the United States, um, one in Spain, a couple in Canada. Um, and, and these support groups are offering that, that group support, that group feel for, for those folks who are interested in that type of support opportunity. Um, many of the groups are still meeting virtually right now, but some are starting to go back in person. Um, so I really encourage you to check those lists out um, on zerocancer.org. We're also thrilled to offer groups specific to Black men, gay men and their partners, uh, deaf men, Spanish-speaking men, um, as well as caregivers. Um, so really excited about our, our support groups and our support programs. Um, also on Zero's website, you'll find a variety of educational resources like one-pagers, questions to ask your doctor, content on um, a prostate cancer diagnosis and the latest and greatest in treatment. Um, and I wanted to share just uh, lastly, a few of our upcoming educational events. Uh, next Tuesday, May 24th, we'll have a Facebook Live on precision medicine. Uh, on June 22nd, we're going to have kind of a prostate cancer 101 webinar, prostate health, covering early detection, treatment, and resources you need to know about. Uh, we will also include a registration link in that email that's going to come to you after uh, tonight's webinar. Um, on June, uh, excuse me, July 27th, we're actually going to host a webinar on what prostate cancer is like for the LGBTQIA plus community. So we're really thrilled to um, have that discussion about the unique needs there. And be sure to check our website. We continue to add webinars and, and other educational events um, continually. So we would love to have you join us. I'd like to take one more brief moment to thank Boston Scientific for their generous sponsorship of today's webinar and this two-part webinar series. The, the first of this series occurred last week and it's, that recording is also available on our website. And uh, just to Boston Scientific, we're so grateful for you, your support and all of the work that you do for the prostate cancer community. Finally, getting to Dr. Albert Chang. Uh, the, the, the lead of our webinar this evening, who will provide us information on prostate cancer treatment options and risk mitigation for radiation therapy. After uh, Dr. Chang's presentation, we will then take questions from our audience. So please use the Q&A box to uh, type those questions and we will get those answered um, to the best of our ability at the end of Dr. Chang's presentation. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Albert Chang. Um, you can see all of Dr. Chang's, um, I shouldn't say all, probably some of Dr. Chang's amazing bio here on the screen. Um, Dr. Chang is the Vice Chair of Surgical Services and Brachytherapy Service Chief for the Department of Radiation Oncology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and the UCLA Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Chang received his PhD in molecular medicine and medical degrees from the Boston, Science, Boston University School of Medicine. So thank you, Dr. Chang, for joining us today. And we're thrilled to hear from you. To speak today, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to meet all of you um, uh, joining this session um, today. Um, the focus of the talk is uh, how we can reduce toxicity uh, that, that's seen uh, and associated with radiation treatment for prostate cancer. Most of the talk is going to be focused on how we can reduce uh, GI toxicity, especially. So um, prostate cancer is the most common solid malignancy diagnosed in men. In 2022, there's about 270,000 cases uh, that are estimated to be diagnosed per year, with about 34,500 deaths per year. If you look at the survival rates going 98% uh, around five years uh, and, and to 10 years, the survival is really good. It's really long. Um, most patients survive you know, and they have a good pro prognosis. 
So when with survival, you have to think, you know, down the line, the quality of life and toxicity associated with each treatment. So looking at the prostate, the prostate sits in between the bladder, you can see here, and also the rectum. When thinking about treatments, uh, you, there, there's maybe some perturbation of the organs around this area, and it can affect the bladder in terms of urination and the rectum in terms of um, bowel function. Also not seen, it can affect sexual function, and these all need to be taken into account. So when a patient is diagnosed initially with uh, prostate cancer, especially localized prostate cancer, we take it into account the pathology or the Gleason score. This is essentially, essentially the grading system for prostate cancer. We also take into account the extent of disease by clinical exam and also by imaging. We often get MRI and now PSMA PET scans to determine the extent of exam. And then we also look at the PSA. I think this is the pulse of all, a lot of patients is, what is my PSA, you know, at the time of diagnosis and also at uh, follow. -up. Um, so we take into these three factors mostly. We also take into account the PSA velocity, how fast the PSA is going up. Genomic testing, there's a bunch of new genomic tests that are out on the market. One of them is the Cypher, which we use a lot. Also, uh, Prolarius and Oncotype that are used. The amount of tumor, like the number of cores that are involved out of uh, biopsy, or also the volume of tumor on MRI. And there's additional models and labs that we take into account um, for determining the severity of prostate cancer. Taking it all into all this into account, we tend to group our patients into different risk categories. Um, here you can see this is the NCCN risk grouping. It's based on the risk of recurrence. It goes from very low to low, intermediate, high, and very high, mostly based on the uh, T stage, as I mentioned, the extended disease, the grade, the glycine grade group, the uh, PSA, and also uh, the volume of disease, the number of cores. So depending on which group, it can help us guide decision-making in terms of treatment. Um, we tend to, what I tend to group patients, most patients with low risk prostate cancer, we tend to recommend active surveillance. And then in the favorable intermediate, we tend to uh, recommend uh, external vein treatment either with SBRT or uh, moderate hypofractionation. And I'll get into that later. Another option is a radical prostatectomy. And going from unfavorable to high to very high, patients are candidates for radical prostatectomy, external beam plus brachy, uh, plus or minus uh, hormone therapy, and we'll get into that next. So th these are the NCCN guidelines for the management of favorable risk prostate cancer, um, either active surveillance, external beam, such as SBRT, like I mentioned earlier, moderately hypofractionated IMRT, or standardly conventionally fractionated IMRT. I know um, the, I'll get into the definitions of uh, what each of these are in, in a bit. Brachytherapy, which is a form of internal radiation, and then surgery with or without lymph node dissection. And then if uh, patients are diagnosed with more aggressive prostate cancer, like unfavorable intermediate to high risk, uh, they're still candidates for surgery, external beam radiation with hormone therapy, and depending on how aggressive the disease is, uh, they either get four months to six months, up to 18 to 24 months of hormone therapy. And uh, there's more and more data coming out that adding brachytherapy to external beam radiation uh, with or without hormone therapy will then improve outcomes and patients uh, will manage with an unfavorable intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer. So that's a lot of different choices. Now, when I see a patient in the clinic, um, they ask, wow, there's so many choices. I'm confused. I often th think of this cartoon. I don't know, Buzz. There's too many options. And how do we um, 
um, get through all the all these different treatment options and choose what's best for you. So uh, one of the studies uh, that has been uh, presented and published was a study that was done in the UK. There's been multiple studies attempting comparing surgery with radiation, but none of them have been able to be completed except for this study. This patient took mostly favorable patients, 1,643 patients, and randomized them to active surveillance, radical prostatectomy, and radiation treatment. This was standard conventionally fractionated radiation, 74 gray and 30 fractions. Uh, the patients got an older style of radiation um, pre-IMRT, and um, uh, the patients also got some hormone therapy, three to six months of hormone therapy with their treatment. You can see that most of the patients, like I mentioned before, was a favorable risk prostate cancer. And this is what we expected, that you wouldn't see any difference in outcomes in terms of survival um, in the patients, whether they got active surveillance, uh, radiation treatment, or surgery. But what I found the most interesting in this study is looking at the patient reported outcomes uh, in terms of urination, sexual function, and bowel movements. So here you can see um, in red is radical prostatectomy, yellow radiation treatment, and blue is just active surveillance, okay? And you can see looking at urinary incontinence, um, it's worse and it, pe it peaks right after uh, surgery and then it starts to improve, but it doesn't get too baseline. Radiation, there was no difference uh, comparing it with just watching in terms of any leakage. Any significant leakage, again, surgery was much worse. Uh, what radiation did worse in was um, in, initially was in terms of waking up at night to urinate. This is mostly during and right after radiation treatment, then it starts to improve. And it gets pretty similar to that of just watching it. This is, uh, so um, one of the uh, things I think about, and I always try to make uh, something uh, light in, uh, in, 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 in a difficult situation. After prostatectomy, patients uh, uh, will com complain about stress uh, incontinence. And this is a cartoon I saw, you made me laugh so hard that tears ran down my leg. So looking at sexual function from that study, um, with surgery, uh, the patients had much more difficulty with uh, erectile dysfunction. They had worse sexual function score that uh, persisted and their quality of life uh, in terms of uh, the sexual domain was much worse than uh, either radiation or active surveillance. What we did see was a decrement also in radiation initially, but it returned back uh, to uh, very similar to active surveillance. And one thing to account for why you see this decrement is because of uh, the patients were on three to six months of hormone therapy. I think now, um, if this study was done now, we wouldn't be giving hormone therapy because I don't think there's gonna be a huge benefit of adding hormone therapy in this favorable risk cohort of patients. Uh, what we saw um, radiation do worse in is uh, loose stools, okay? Loose stools initially uh, during treatment and right after treatment. But over time, like one year to two years, out, up to five years, that returned very similar, very close to radical prostatectomy and active surveillance. Also, patients did worse in uh, having bloody stools, you know. Uh, most of these are going to be grade two, like, uh, or grade one, um, they usually uh, go, uh, the bloody stools usually uh, spontaneously resolve on its own. So this is a cartoon for the patients that get radiation, especially uh, during radiation uh, and right after radiation. Some patients might experience urge, uh, urge uh, 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 with diarrhea. And I think of this, where will you be when your diarrhea strikes? So when you, since as a radiation college, 
uh, oncologist, I'm going to just focus on radiation treatment. And I like to think about radiation into two different categories, external beam radiation and internal ra radiation, which is brachytherapy, which is something I uh, subspecialize in. External beam radiation uh, uses a high energy x-ray machine to, to deliver x-rays or gamma rays. Radiation gets delivered from outside in. The analogy I like to use is the spokes of a bicycle tire where uh, the spokes are the beams of, of radiation and they converge at the center, which would be the hub. So the radiation dose would essentially be summated at the center of the um, where the prostate is, and you would have a lower dosage in the surrounding area, which would be like the spokes of the bicycle tire. Uh, the, you'll hear about IMRT. It's a type of external radiation and SBRT or types of external radiation. The advantage is it's less invasive. And if you walk into any radiation oncology department, they're going to be able to deliver external beam radiation. It's less user and, uh, dependent. Brachytherapy comes from the uh, Greek word brachy, mean, meaning short. If, for those that have um, uh, met me, I'm short, but this is pertaining to brachytherapy, not me. Um, so what's nice about brachytherapy is that it, uh, the radiation is placed directly into the target or the tumor. In this situation, it would be in the prostate. And instead of the radiation having to cross through normal tissue to get to the target, it's placed directly in and the radiation goes from inside out. So it allows us to spare the surrounding normal tissue much better from radiation and it allows us to deliver higher dose of, uh, of radiation to the target. And uh, because we're able to spare the nor surrounding normal tissues. So this is a IMRT or SBRT machine. This is the true beam that we here have here at UCLA. Here is the linear accelerator head that produces the higher energy x-rays. And at the head, you'll have these uh, leaves, these lead leaves that can uh, move dynamically in and out and can shape the radiation field and also can shape the intensity of the radiation. What this head does is it rotates around in a 360 degree fraction or arc and delivers the uh, higher energy x-rays, um, like I mentioned um, before. Uh, these are the different types of uh, uh, external beam radiation, IMRT and SBRT. We use the same machines. So this is the true beam machine. Uh, this is a cyber knife machine. Um, a lot of patients will, will be like, oh, do you have a cyber knife? And it's not uh, actually any cutting. It's, uh, it was developed in part with a neurosurgeon up at Stanford where they attached a x-ray producing machine to a robotic arm. This is the same robotic arm that they use in the motor plants in uh, Detroit. Uh, and it could rotate in non coplanar um, angles to deliver radiation. Here is a proton machine. The proton machines are huge. They're pretty expensive. They can be 50 million to $200 million. And uh, it can encompass several levels. Uh, this is the cyclotron where the proton is produced and it gets delivered. This is the uh, treatment center where uh, it gets delivered, where the patient can lie and receive the radiation treatment. We also have a MRI guided uh, machine, the V-Ray at UCLA and where we can uh, use the MRI to track real-time our radiation delivery. So when we give radiation, we tend to give higher doses. Um, there's been uh, multiple studies that show that when you go to a higher dose, these are five randomized trials. So this is pretty good evidence that when you get, go to a higher dose, you can Im improve recurrence-free survival. One uh, trial out of MD Anderson also showed that um, going to higher doses um, can improve the, uh, or reduce the risk of spread of prostate cancer. Um, so when we give high doses of radiation, you know, because the radiation is coming from outside in uh, from all different angles, it's difficult to avoid uh, dose to the rectum here you see in the brown and also to the bladder here, okay? 
but you're still able to get a very high dose through a prostate. The blue is a, um, the, and green are lower doses of radiation. We usually know what doses we can give uh, to uh, minimize the risk of toxicity. But that being said, um, these are the external beam radiation regimens. So earlier I promised you, I'll explain what IMRT is. So IMRT, like I mentioned, the beams come from all different angles and they converge at the center. Um, the conventionally fractionated IMRT, um, we give a lower dose per day, 1.8 to 2.0 gray. And treatment occurs over 37 to 45 days. So this can be over, you know, um, up to eight, eight to nine weeks of treatment, Monday through Friday, it's pretty lengthy. And the total dose that we go to for prostate cancer is well, 74 to 81 gray. Then um, being that this is a pretty lengthy schedule, we looked at other radiation treatment regimens. So we tried to go to a higher dose per day. Um, this is what we call moderate hypofractionation. Uh, we go to a dose of 2.5 to three and a half gray. Uh, per day uh, for 20 to 28 days, up to a dose of 60 to 70 gray. So this isn't a lower dose uh, biologically because you're giving a much higher dose per day, you're hitting the cancer uh, at a higher dose. And prostate cancer, when you uh, think the biology is, when you hit it at very high doses, it might have a larger effect on killing the prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And then SBRT is what we call ultra hypofraction, hypo, ultra hypofractionated radiation. And uh, it's given that uh, anywhere from 7.25 up to eight gray per day over four to seven days. And in the United States, we usually do it over five days. And the dose ranges anywhere from 36.25 up to 42.7 gray. We're doing 40 gray at UCLA. So um, when you look at uh, comparisons of standard fractionated uh, radiation with the 39 treatments to SBRT, uh, there has been two uh, randomized studies that have been performed today. Uh, this hypo-RT-PC trial took 1,200 patients, mostly in intermediate risk disease, 10% had high risk disease, and randomized them to the standard fractionated the 39 treatments versus the SBRT and seven treatments. And they showed that there was no difference in recurrence free survival. 10 years out, it's about 70%. Uh, what, uh, th they also looked at uh, bowel toxicity, urinary toxicity, here's the bowel toxicity. You can see in terms of this is patient reported. So patients were asked to fill out questionnaires. You can see that with the more SBRT, the ultra hypofraction unit, there was a more, uh, I guess, uh, about, about uh, side effects uh, or GI side effects early on, but there was no difference in the long-term, you know, eight to 10 years out. When you look at long-term uh, grade two and grade three bowel toxicity, it was about 10% and one and a half to 2% in both treatments, whether the patients got conventionally fractionated or ultra hypofractionated radiation. The PACE-B trial uh, compared a uh, standard to moderately uh, or moderately hypofractionated radiation, uh, 39 or 20 treatments versus the five treatment SBRT. And what they saw that was also the toxicity was very similar whether you got conventionally fractionated or hypofractionated, ultra hypofractionated with SBRT treatments. Uh, grade two toxicity was 11 to 10%, and grade three toxicity was pretty rare, 1%. And the bowel uh, patient reported outcomes um, was uh, you see a decrement at uh, four weeks out, and then by 12 weeks, it starts to improve and get close to baseline, but it's not all the way back to baseline. So looking at all different studies, these are studies, not just the randomized studies that I presented. Looking at GI toxicity, grade two um, is about anywhere from 10 up to 40%. Uh, any gr uh, severe grade three toxicity is in the single digits. So any um, that 
great degree toxicity is what I would consider, consider needing a procedure, like a surgery to correct or using like a, a colonoscopy with argon laser coagulation to stop bleeding. So that is what I call grade three. And that's pretty rare. Grade two is needing uh, medicines to correct, okay? And from SBRT, looking at uh, grade two and grade three toxicity is very similar to that of the conventionally fractionated uh, uh, IMRT uh, the, the, in the slide I just recently showed. It's around 10 up to 40% and grade three toxicity is in the single digits. So um, a lot, if you pull a lot of radiation oncologists, some radiation oncologists will tell you, you know, I don't see much toxicity. You know, here you can see multiple studies where uh, toxicity is recorded. It, there is some toxicity and when, uh, the toxicity comes from um, the splash dose of radiation um, uh, in the surrounding normal tissues. Um, and as a radiation oncologist, we're taught that we should try to minimize dose to the surrounding tissues as much as possible. There's an acronym we use, ALARA, as low as reasonably achieved. And that's what we always try to achieve when we're developing a radiation treatment plan for our patients. So the rationale for space or hydrogel, uh, rectal radiation, as you've seen uh, in the previous slides, is often unavoidable due to the close proximity of the prostate next to the rectum. So you can inject a gel, the, the space or gel, um, and it essentially displaces the rectum away from the prostate and allows for um, more uh, of a comfort margin when you radiate the prostate to minimize the radiation dose to the rectum. So this is a MRI. Um, of a patient. I actually took it, this from the Boston Scientific website. And here you can see the prostate and it's right adjacent to the rectum, okay? Um, so after um, injection of the spacer, uh, they did a study when, when they injected the spacer, it's about a one to one and a half centimeter distance that's created on average uh, between the prostate and rectum. And it persists about three months and it starts to get reabsorbed after uh, three months. And by 12 months, um, that um, uh, spacer gel is um, uh, uh, out of your system. So um, Boston, uh, the spacer um, trial, um, this is the US pivotal trial, took patients that were receiving radiation and were randomized to spacer or without spacer. Uh, the patients got conventionally fractionated radiation. This is the eight-week course of treatment. And what SPACER led to is you can see a reduction in the volume of a rectum receiving radiation. So on the y-axis is the rectal percentage volume. And these are the doses. This is the high, highest dose, 80 gray, 75, down to 50. And you can see that um, the patients that got the spacer are in the gray bar. It's the amount of rectum that was radiated was much less than the patients that did, did not receive um, the spacer. And then uh, they also looked at uh, the amount of bladder receiving radiation, and they saw that the patients receiving spacer had less um, bladder that, were, that received radiation and then the, the patients that did not get the spacer on the study. This uh, led to improvements uh, both in grade one, rectal and grade two toxicity. You can see the gray again, the patients that got the spacer had lower rectal toxicity than the patients that did not get spacer. And also they saw less uh, incontinence risk uh, or less rate of incontinence um, in the patients that got the spacer. So, um, Less normal tissue irradiated um, this, in this uh, setting of spacer leads to a lot less toxicity and the improvement in quality of life. So more space created leads to less uh, rectal complications, urinary complications, uh, sexual complications, and improves your quality of life. This was a study um, done mm -hmm. by Dr. Selevsky over at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. 
and uh, 551 patients that received the SBRT, the five fraction treatment regimen. Half of the patients uh, received the spacer hydrogel. And you saw, you can see that the patients that got spacer had less GI and GU toxicity. Another way to reduce toxicity is doing active tracking. At UCLA, we have a view rate MRI. Um, and this is supposed to be a video, but I don't think it's uh, working. Um, sorry about that, guys. But um, here, one more, during treatment, we can actively track the uh, motion of the prostate. Uh, over treatment, the bladder and the rectum can expand so the prostate can move. And we can actively track the prostate when we're treating to show, ensure that it's in our target and we're not uh, accidentally irradiating the bladder or the rectum. It allows us also to um, shrink any uncertainty margins that we uh, create um, for in terms of our treatment planning to reduce those to the surrounding normal tissues. So this is a uh, one of my colleagues studied, uh, Dr. Kashanda, he recently presented. He showed that when you use the V-ray, the MRI guided radiation, it reduced both GU, uh, urinary toxicity, and GI toxicity significantly. Uh, now it comes to what I'm really passionate about is brachytherapy. I always feel that good things come in small packages and um, brachytherapy, um, when you look at it, it's small. I'm, I'm also very small, by the way. So um, this is the Electa Flexitron, the Varian Bravos. Um, these are two machines uh, that carry uh, Iridium-192 as a radioactive source. The radioactive source you can see can be depicted here and compared to the size of a dime. It's about three millimeters in size and it's loaded uh, onto, it's welded actually on, onto the tip of a, uh, uh, of a wire. And uh, what happens is the radioactive uh, wire, the wire comes in and out of the head of each of the machines. And um, we insert tubes into the patient and um, it can give dose of radiation to the prostate via that point. So th this is HDR breaking therapy. We do an ultrasound of the prostate. You can see the, the tumor, the prostate, and under also the sound guidance, will place uh, catheters through the skin directly into the uh, prostate and into the tumor. Um, so once the tubes are in, uh, the radiation can go, the wire can travel in the tube in one to five millimeter increments. And depending on how long it sits in and these, uh, what we call dwell positions, the one, one to five millimeter increments, it, um, it it is essentially proportional to the amount of radiation that gets delivered in that immediate vicinity. So you can, you can use these tubes and this radiation, internal radiation to really paint the radiation in the prostate and boost areas that have high volume cancer and minimize the dose to their surrounding tissues. So when we um, do our MRI or our treatment planning, we incorporate the MRI. This is an MRI of a patient. You can see the, uh, the T2 hypointense uh, lesion here on the MRI cor correlating to the diffusion weighted image. And we also do a PSMA PET. In this situation, the PSMA PET was able to detect, detect uptake in the contralateral side on the right side of the prostate. So when we went into treatment planning, we contoured out the um, areas that had tumor and also the entire prostate. Note that this patient also has a uh, space or in this uh, situation. Um, there's supposed to be a video on that place that shows the treatment planning where we can actively uh, see, build a dose cloud around the prostate, spare the urethra, spare the bladder and the rectum and tweak on the fly um, to optimize the dose of radiation to the prostate. So here's the final treatment plan. You can see the spacer here and here, and you can see that the prostate is getting a very high dose of radiation. These are the areas that we're boosting with higher doses of radiation. We're able to spare the urethra centrally 
and the rectum is essentially getting minimal to no dose of radiation. When we compare IMRT uh, versus protons versus HDR brachytherapy, looking at the dosimetry, you can see IMRT, uh, this is the same thing with SBRT. You'll get some low dose spillage into the rectum. Uh, proton can spare it potentially better. Uh, one um, uh, issue with proton is that I think the setup is not going to be as accurate as the uh, IMRT uh, machines. And brachytherapy, you're able to deliver a very high dose. You see the dose going up in scale. Most of it is in pink. Uh, versus the protons and the IMRT, but you're able to spare a lot of the low dose from going into the surrounding tissues. Here we compared here at UCLA, the patient getting brachytherapy and same patient getting SBRT to the prostate. And you can see the um, relative sparing of the low dose of radiation to the surrounding normal tissues or uh, brachytherapy. We use brachytherapy in uh, pretty much all of localized prostate cancer. In favorable risk disease, we do brachytherapy alone. In high risk disease, we combine it with external beam uh, radiation to treat the pelvic lymph nodes. And we also do a lot of uh, radiation treatment for prior radiation failures. So often here, the urologists state that if you had uh, prior radiation, you can't get surgery, but there's other options, uh, including uh, rear radiation with uh, brachytherapy. Looking at uh, toxicity um, and uh, control rates with brachytherapy at, at, as brachytherapy alone, um, you can see that the control rates, recurrence free survival, five to 10 years out, is about 95 to 95% uh, and above. Any significant toxicity, grade three toxicity is very low. That's around 2% uh, here, you can see. Here's our data uh, from UCLA um, for PSA recurrence-free survival for low-risk patients is 99%, for intermediate-risk patients is 95%, which I feel is very excellent. And toxicity is very low. GI toxicity, grade one, two toxicity combined is about 2%. Grade three, any significant late toxicity with just the monotherapy alone is very low, 0%. Um, there was uh, grade one, two GU toxicity is about 10%. This is like patients that need uh, Flomax or uh, um, any alpha blockers uh, for urinary frequency, urgency, and such. And any patient needing a procedure was about 4% grade three toxicity. Most uh, of these were, were patients that were treated earlier on that had very large prostates and baseline urinary symptoms where they should have had a TUR, uh, transurethral resection, to open up the urethral passage earlier on. Instead, they got that after the brachytherapy, so we counted it as a toxicity. So, so looking at sexual function um, and the ability to perform intercourse, the average age of diagnosis was about 64 years old. Five years out, 80% of men are able to perform an intercourse. 10 years out, 60% of men. And when you compare this to the men without any prostate cancer treatment at the age of 75, it's about 60%. It's pretty equivalent. Um, we looked at our space or data um, in patients that received space or during brachytherapy versus without. The black is without spacer and the gray is with spacer. Spacer still helps us to achieve a lower rectal dose. Um, I also like to uh, use it uh, with uh, brachytherapy because it allows us to give more flexibility to boost certain areas or give extra dose to areas of bulky disease. Uh, here's our uh, brachytherapy uh, um, schedule. Um, most patients will come in for two separate treatments, 13 and a half gray, uh, one to two weeks apart for two procedures. And one procedure uh, for patients flying in from uh, out of state or overseas will uh, keep them overnight and deliver two fractions of 13 and a half gray uh, times two. So we, we also do HDR. So the monotherapy alone, we usually uh, reserve that for 
the favorable intermediate risk and that some of the patients both um, very favorable, more favorable, unfavorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. Um, we do HDR breaky therapy in combination with external beam for patients that have more aggressive disease. Um, Dr. Kishan uh, uh, from uh, my colleague here at, in this department, I uh, looked at a study and he took data from 12 centers and included 1,800 patients. And he compared patients that got surgery, external beam radiation, or external beam radiation with brachytherapy. About half of the patients that had surgery under, uh, also underwent uh, radiation after their surgery. What's interesting is that uh, the patients that had external beam radiation their average uh, or median duration of hormone therapy was 22 months. And the patients that got uh, brachytherapy, their median duration of hormone therapy was much shorter, almost half, 12 months. So looking at uh, survival rates, uh, the patients that got the combination of external beam plus brachytherapy had the best survival rate compared to surgery or external beam radiation. Uh, also, they also had the best distant metastasis free survival and overall survival. Um, there's been other phase three studies looking at combining uh, brachytherapy to external beam treatment. This is one of them out of your Hoskin et al. that showed that adding brachytherapy to external beam radiation decreased the risk of relapse in patients. And uh, RTOG0321 also looked at the combination of uh, external beam radiation with high-dose rate brachytherapy. They had excellent uh, recurrence-free survival. These are in patients that had uh, aggressive disease, high-risk disease, and um, they showed very low toxicity, uh, less than 5% long-term, any significant toxicity. Um, there was a, a noted 2% local failure rate at 10 years, which I think is a very low rate of local failure in these patient cohorts. So the ASCO and the uh, Cancer Care Center in Ontario um, states that in patients with high-risk prostate cancer, the uh, brachytherapy boost should be offered to eligible patients. So to conclude, um, um, toxicity, there is some toxicity associated with radiation treatment for prostate cancer and GI toxicity is seen in the 10 uh, up to the 40% range, depending if it's acute or a GI toxicity. I think very severe grade three or higher toxicity is in the single digits. Uh, space or it helps us to reduce toxicity uh, as it is able to displace the rectum away from the prostate and reduce radiation dose to the rectum. Um, also real-time tracking techniques like with the Uray uh, or MRI guided radiation treatment and brachytherapy can lead to reduction in uh, uh, toxicity, including GI toxicity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. We do have a couple of questions. That was a lot of information. So really appreciate all of the great insight and um, apologize for the videos not working. Um, we can reach out to um, our partners at Boston Scientific and see if we can maybe try to get some of those videos posted to our website or maybe links to those shared in some follow-up emails for everyone. Um, let me just pull up some of the questions here um, um, and, and see which ones kind of make the most sense. Um, we have a, a question coming in about um, the incidence and I think effectiveness of uh, urinary uh, stictures for various types of radiation treatments are, and the, the specific question is, are they especially high for brachytherapy? But maybe if you could just speak to that, that would be wonderful. So, yeah, I think um, if brachytherapy is done uh, in the hands of experienced uh, practitioners and going to a high volume center, the risk of uh, stricture is pretty low. Um, and, and in our hands, I would say it's about anywhere from one to 2%, I would say. And most of them, most of the patients are asymptomatic um, from it. 
Um, we often pick it up incidentally on the cystoscopy. Um, I think um, there was concern about strictures. There was a one trial um, that I didn't talk to about too much because it was more with the permanent seed implants. We do uh, high dose rate brachytherapy. It was a, a trial run out of Canada where they compared external beam radiation uh, with uh, uh, external beam radiation with brachytherapy. All patients had 12 months of hormone therapy on that study. And there was a much higher rate of stricture. And uh, it was concerning. They showed that, that adding brachytherapy dramatically reduced the risk of uh, recurrences, uh, especially PSA recurrences. Um, but I think on that study, they added a margin inferiorly to where they were treated and they were treating pretty low. So that's why there was a higher incidence of strictures on that study. But I think if it's done in very good hands, the incidence of strictures can be very low. Great, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have time for a few more questions, um, if that's okay, Dr. Chang. We have one uh, that came in. Um, the question is, should a patient be concerned if their uh, doctor is telling them that they are not a candidate for the space or gel due to the location of the cancer? Um, and there's a, a little bit of um, a mention of a possible lymph node involvement or the cancer that might be closer to the rectum. So uh, uh, I think I think a, a physician's expertise or a radiation oncologist or a physician's expertise should always be considered. I think um, on on the study, uh, um, the uh, patients that had extra ca capsular extension uh, were uh, excluded on the study for uh, space or I think. It can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on where the, um, the cancer is. I think also, you know, in the recurrent setting, um, not everyone should be doing, I feel, should be doing spacer in that setting. Um, I think the physician has to be well-trained in doing spacer, but also um, there sometimes can be fibrosis that can form in a space that doesn't open up and um, in that situation, it, it shouldn't be performed. But I think um, it, I, I think it really depends on the clinical situation and the experience and the judgment of the uh, the practitioner. Great, thank you. Um, another question has come in, and this patient has had a radical prostatectomy followed by radiation, um, and is explaining that his bladder leakage is quite high. Um, this has been uh, about five years ago, but the symptoms seem to be persisting. So is, uh, this patient's wondering about any um, new uh, uh, therapies or, or um, uh, management options beyond, beyond an artificial sphincter. Yeah, um, I, I think there's, I'm not an expert in reconstructive surgery, but I think it's good to talk to a reconstructive or pelvic surgeon that specializes in this. They have different sling procedures. Um, I think last week there was a, um, um, a discussion based on, you know, management of uh, incontinence after surgery. Um, thank you. We have another question that's come in about um, the, the space or uh, being used with brachytherapy. Um, uh, the space or gel um, being irradiated, and can this have an adverse effect when the gel is absorbed by the body? No. Um, so um, the the spacer is going to get radiation, whether you do brachytherapy or external beam radiation. It's been tested in, in this situation and it's been shown to be safe. When you do brachytherapy, um, the way we do brachytherapy, the, um, we're putting radiation directly into the prostate, but it's temporary radiation. We're putting tubes into the prostate and we remove the tubes. Up. The spacer will be in, there's no radiation left in, in the patient. So it's going to be safe. We do a quite a, very often. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question. 
Uh, let's see, are the risks of toxicity from salvage radiation similar? Um, the, there, is, there is some increased risk because you're going back a second time for radiation, but any severe, any significant complications is, has, has been pretty low, right? especially if you go to an experienced practitioner um, that does uh, uh, brachytherapy. I favor high dose rate brachytherapy in this situation over like the permanent seed implant because you can really fine tune the radiation even before you deliver it. When you're giving permanent seeds, you're dropping a seed in and it can migrate or not come out exactly the way you want it. But I think uh, the high dose rate brachytherapy is more forgiving. And we have data, you know, any significant complications is, you know, in less than 5% you know, uh, in this situation. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to lump a couple of these questions together uh, in, in how I phrase this next one, but um, you've mentioned a couple of times really important to find a practitioner who's just really experienced. And um, so this is kind of, I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to kind of merge these two, but um, I think one of the questions is just directly to you and how many brachytherapy patients do you see each year and, and really just more generally, how can one or how does one find um, a really experienced practitioner for high dose radiation? Yeah, so I think, um, so the first question is, sorry, can you? No, that's okay. Um, well, how many do you? Uh, how many do cases do I, we yeah. do? We do about three. On average, I would say three cases per day, every day, Monday through Friday, and up to five cases per day. So it's quite a bit. Um, um, and we're pretty high volume. Um, the second question is, how do you find? Um, I, I think that's one of the struggles that we have now in our society is that there's not a ton of radiation oncologists that are uh, that do a lot of brachytherapy or do any brachytherapy at all. And we're trying to train more and more radiation oncologists to do this. Yeah. And uh, if you want, my email's up there. If you ever want to email me, I'm happy to refer you to any of my colleagues. And you know, if that are closer, or I'm happy to help you out. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Chang. We're coming up right um, on the hour. So I'm gonna conclude our questions. I apologize for not being able to get to all of them, but um, Dr. Chang, I wanna thank you once again for spending your um, afternoon and, and early evening with us. And to all of our participants, thank you um, for, for being here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to uh, thank our, our sponsor for tonight's webinar one last time, Boston Scientific. Thank you very much for, for your support. Um, and I, there was a question also that I, I didn't get, but I'll cover it now. This recording will be available on our website and it'll also be emailed to you um, if you registered. And um, again, just one, one more plug for our short survey at the end of uh, this, this event and in the, in the email tomorrow. Um, so our webinar is now concluded and I wanna thank you one more time for joining us and I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.